Welcome to this video, this previewing video for the symposium session on flipped classroom. So flipped classroom, uh, the reason I want to have you view this video is so that we can get some of the background knowledge out of the way. We can touch upon case studies from other institutions. So I'm going to look at 11 other institutions in Singapore, UK, US and Australia. I note some academics aren't comfortable watching the work of others in other disciplines. Well, I'm going to cover off some of that by having a diverse range of disciplines, physics, chemistry, law, language, teaching, medicine, bioscience and business. And in our session, you'll hear from scholars in different academic disciplines. So you'll get a nice rounded view. Discussions hopefully will flow from that. So what is the flipped classroom? This is not rocket science. Access to material beforehand, build on that in the classroom, dive deeper, deeper learning, follow up outside of the classroom. Probably one of the best definitions I've seen is from Vanderbilt University. And it's a very straightforward one that summarizes just what I said a moment ago. One of the great proponents of the flipped classroom is Eric Mazur. Professor Mazur is in physics at Harvard and he's also a proponent of what I'll call the subgrouping of flipped classroom, which is peer instruction. And in that, he gets his students to answer a poll using polling software like Poll Everywhere. Uh, he'll ask a question, they'll give an answer, he blanks the screen, he gets the students to turn to the student next to them and explain why they gave that answer. They then resubmit an answer to the same question. And it's interesting to see how that changes. The students are instruction, instructing each other, it is peer instruction. But more broadly, let's hear why Mazur thinks Flipped classroom is a great methodology. However, the crucial part of an education is for the student to make sense of that information, to have the aha moments, oh, I get it, so that you can apply the knowledge embedded in information in a new context. Unfortunately, when you listen to a lecture, there's no time for that aha moment, there's no time. The only thing you can do is take the information down. If you try to think, you lose track of what the person says because you cannot think and talk at the same time. So where, for most people, I'm, I've asked myself often, where did that happen for me, these aha moments? Where did I make sense of the information? Well, that happened outside of the classroom. So in the standard approach to teaching, the information transfer is in the classroom. The sense making is out of the classroom. If you ask yourself pragmatically, which is the harder part? I think we all agree it's a second part, the sense making. So why not flip this around and do the easy part outside of the classroom, the transfer of information, books, video, and then in class we think about it. So there are a number of buzzwords out there in, in the educational technology uh, turf, such as technology enhanced learning, active learning, uh, personalized learning, hate that one, all learning is personal, it should be personalized instruction, and so on. The flipped classroom is really all about an understanding of the fact that the didactic lecture itself is not a very efficient way to transfer knowledge. In fact, Farrell et al. wrote about that in a recent paper when they looked at the learning pyramid, where they found that doing and teaching, think about Mazur's peer instruction in this case, the students are not only te doing, but they are teaching their colleagues, is where the most effective learning occurs, where we hit this active learning scenario. Now at Ohio State University in chemistry, again, this technology was embraced. In their case, they really use the flipped classroom hand in hand with technology. They have what's called the Digital First Initiative, where they're digitizing all their material and trying to use the technology effectively in the teaching of their students. Let's hear from them. A former student of mine uh, approached me uh, last spring break and we were talking about what we can do to improve student performance in the classroom. And we've adopted this flipping the classroom approach where the students watch lecture videos online, they do a pre-lecture assignment, and then that opens up the classroom space for us to have better discussions, to dig into the deep underlying concepts of the chemistry content, and to also get them to work on problems rather than just copy down notes. Ten years ago I wouldn't be able to do this because I would have had to write the lecture on the chalkboard, the students would have to copy it down, but now with the technology that we have, it really opens up the, the classroom for us. I think it's a, a very um, 
exciting time in education because uh, at a school like Ohio State we have plenty of resources available to play around and really enhance our learning for our students and, and that's really the bottom line to better deliver the content and to get our students to understand some concepts that they may not have picked up if we taught in a traditional way. So a number of staff are more than comfortable dealing with educational technology and let me point out that the flipped classroom doesn't necessitate the use of educational technology but certainly this can enhance the whole experience and nearly every example I've seen technology has been used at one level or another. Now the research that came out of our friends from Campus Technology 2016, this was in September 2016, on staff who use technology found that the vast majority, 88%, found it improved their teaching. And certainly good teachers are good teachers with or without technology. James Avenatakis, for example, at Western Sydney, um, has this great challenge of large class sizes and uses technology to flip the classroom. He produces e-books for the students every week to review the week before, to raise questions that they will need to answer in the large group learning. He, of course, also breaks the students up into groups. Now, these students are comfortable with technology. We've all heard the buzzwords that are out there, be it uh, digital native or Gen Y. And if we look at the digital native and Prensky's definition of it, a lot of folks would say, well, we've moved on. All students have these sorts of skills. They are essentially individuals who are a CE technology as an extension of themselves. It's interesting that many young, young academics, uh, folks like Carl Berger from Michigan are calling millennial instructors. So a number of uh, not only staff, but students are comfortable with the technology. I'm not gonna dive too deeply into how skilled up the students are, how much they understand technology, but I will note that just because they can use technology for social networking doesn't mean they know how to use it in teaching and learning. But the largest studies are probably the ECAR study in the US and in the UK just report in June this year. And if we look at some of the feedback from those studies, we'll find that students uh, pretty much all have desktops, uh, in, the in the case of laptops, smartphones, tablets, and many own more than one of these devices. You'll note that the UK uh, feedback, actually ownership is lower than the US. Interesting. And another report that's worth noting, and here we can see a lovely active learning learning space, is the Horizon report. 75 universities reporting back on that, five from Australia New Zealand. Now having said the UK ownership of devices was lower than the US, it's interesting that uh, universities such as London School of Economics, which is one of the Russell Group universities, certainly students are very switched on when it comes to technology. And only recently they were asked to give feedback as to how they saw teaching in 2020. Let's hear from some of the students. So we have PowerPoint, pretty much as far as it goes. It's still a system of one to many, where there's one practitioner and many students. I think there's a huge opportunity for us to engage more with technology in our teaching and learning. What is it? It's click yes. the clicker system. Click with a, yeah. It has a special name, something pointer. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I think that if it can add something, and like, especially with lectures, to make them a bit more interactive, would probably be nice. My university at home, we don't have lecture capture, so that's seems pretty advanced that you have that. You only know what's possible in the first bit if you've actually seen it, and I don't really know what's, what great alternatives there are. Something like virtual reality to make it more interactive. Interactive presentations. Sometimes make the uh, course more interesting. But probably they'll try and make it more interactive and like more to do to enhance learning. 
expect that exams will probably take place on computers. This, this is this idea of flipping the class. I think that classes will be available online. I imagine we can literally sit online and have a virtual classroom or a virtual lecture. I do think when we are talking about a new education strategy and a new uh, experience for education that we make sure that technology is right in the heart of that. I think it's more about the way that we can embed technology in those processes. That facilitates the learning. Technology kind of touches basically everything I do with my study. If it's going to be useful, it needs to be easy to use. Now sometimes that pre-work in a flipped class classroom can be in the field. So in the case of Northampton in environmental science, the students actually go out into the field in their own time, co collect the data, they input that into spreadsheets and word processes, and they then upload that to their learning management system, which is Blackboard, uh, aka iLearn in our case. Harrington actually calls this, Harrington being from uh, Western Australia, situated learning, where a lot of the learning happens in situ, on site. Now they then go back to the classroom and dive into that data, draw conclusions, they flipped it around. University of Sydney have done that in molecular biology. In their cir circumstances, you know, it was decided that not a lot had changed in lab work and wet, wet bench work from the 1800s. This King's College snapshot, for example, doesn't look all that different to this current snapshot of wet lab work. Yeah, sure, there's a better gender equity. They're not all gentlemen uh, in this case. Uh, better occupational health. They're wearing white coats as opposed to dapper suits back in the 1800s. And yes, there's some technology. But what's happened here, instead of having the tutor, typically a PhD candidate, discussing the experiment for a full half hour of that prac time, the students are giving that material, given that material as a video before they're in the lab and they're let loose. More efficient use of time and certainly they get to dive a bit deeper. What's also interested is they're using technology to record a lot of their work. So using their smartphones to take photos, to make observations. And Gareth Denyer, who is uh, running this, finds that when they look at the graduate attributes uh, that are defined at uh, Sydney, there's some interesting surprises. For example, creativity, reflection and individual accountability are much higher than they were. Now, other disciplines are certainly using the flipped classroom approach. If I think about law, there's a lot happening here with Yu Zilman and others in law. But Paul Mahag, uh, now at ANU, then at Strathclyde, uh, published a great text, Transforming Legal Education, that's worth a read. In fact, if I talk about the primary sources that are worth a read, there are a number, number of e-books that are available. And the two books, The Flipped Classroom and Flipped Classroom for Legal Education, are well worth a read and are available via the library for download. Medicine. A number of med schools have really run with using the flipped classroom approach. At Lee Kong Chian, which is an interesting partnership in Singapore with uh, Imperial College London, uh, Dr. Raja Lingam has used the flipped classroom approach where the students do all of their prep work before coming to school and then they go through what they call the readiness assurance process before moving on to an application uh, session where they apply the knowledge that they have learned. At Manchester in 2015 they recorded a lovely video and I must thank Colin Lumsden, a neonatologist there, for sharing this with me. They use um, the flipped classroom in clinical reasoning sessions, in this case with third year students. Let's actually see them in action and get an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing and the impact it has. This is a video that shows our recent pilot at Salford Royal for the new third year clinical reasoning sessions. The setup for the event is that we have five groups, each comprising about six students. They're sitting in their groups around tables and the room has been arranged so that all the students can see the lead tutor at the front and they can also engage in group discussion activities during the session. This group of students is one quarter of the third year group at Salford and next academic year we'll be providing these sessions to the whole year group spread out over the course of each Friday. For this pilot we have Anu Trahan, consultant in acute medicine, 
taking the role of the lead tutor and one of her specialist trainees is acting as a facilitator. Anu starts by introducing herself and lets the students know what will be happening over the next 90 minutes and what will be expected of them. The students have had all week to work through online material about this week's topic of asthma and have come to the session expecting to be challenged with new material and given realistic clinical scenarios to work through. For this pilot session we've used Nearpod, which is an iPad application that allows students to see the content slides on their iPads and lets them complete interactive tasks and send their responses back to Anu. These sessions could also be run using traditional materials such as flip charts or whiteboards. Anu starts the session off with a multiple choice quiz to help gauge the student's level of knowledge about this topic area. She then moves on to some activities where the groups need to discuss the relevance of certain physical signs and symptoms in the clinical situation of an acutely breathless patient. Anu provides some teaching about the emergency assessment of patients after the groups have completed these initial tasks. The session continues with the description of a clinical case and the groups are asked to work together to interpret clinical data and come up with management plans. Anu and her facilitator help the groups when necessary and after each activity there's the chance for groups to feed back to the whole room regarding what their thoughts and reasoning were. Students are asked to use the knowledge that they've acquired from their preparation work in the week to solve new clinical problems as the case evolves. The tutors and facilitators are able to provide teaching around areas of difficulty or issues that the student groups are struggling with. Anu finishes the session with some chest x-rays and asks the groups to interpret these images to help them understand what complications may occur in patients such as the one described in this case. The session is brought to a close and the entire student group get a break before moving on to their next teaching activity for the afternoon. Of course there's a lot happening here at Bond and you'll hear from some colleagues in uh, various academic disciplines on how they're using the flipped classroom. Certainly one of the prolific video producers here on campus is Alan Patching and he explains to students why it's important to preview the work before the face-to-face -face classroom experience. Well you can expect a lot of practical work and this is where I need your help. We could come into the classroom and had me up the front talking and drawing on the board and you might learn something. That's if you don't fall asleep in the process. I want you to stay awake, I want you to enjoy and what's more I want to go home saying I've had a lot of fun. So that we can all achieve that I'm going to produce a series of videos not for every aspect of every subject in the course but just for some of them. And on some of the evenings, I'm going to ask you to spend 45 minutes to an hour watching those videos. And then we'll have a little test in the morning to see who really got it. When you come in the next day to the classroom, we won't teach the material. So if you haven't watched the videos, you'll miss out. The University of Queensland's done some interesting work using massively online open courses or MOOCs, not only for external audiences, but for their student cohort both undergraduate and, po and postgraduate. Uh, in this video, take note of the huge figure they speak about when, it's, uh, when they talk about how many downloads have occurred. This was a couple of years ago. But in psychology, Jason Tangent is doing some really interesting work. In Think 101, we are thinking about thinking. That is, we're thinking. I'm Jason Tangen, and I've completely stopped lecturing due to technology like this that allows me to put all of my content online. I've created UQ's first massive open online course called The Science of Everyday Thinking, which is open to anyone, and it's completely free. So far, we've had about 92,000 enrollments in the course. Over the last year, we've traveled all over the world to film conversations with some very clever and interesting people. We combine these conversations with video segments on heuristics and biases, learning strategies, and the scientific method. Putting all of our content online has freed up our time to do some far more interesting things than simply lecturing at people for hours on end. Instead, we have debates, discussions, activities. We can provide feedback face-to-face. -face. 
Students can practice writing and they have time to think. We need to have a clear vision for what a rich campus experience looks like and how we can use online courses to help get us there. And what about language? At Northwestern, they've done some really interesting work in Chinese language. The students actually prepare by going over their audio rehearsals. They record those and then upload them to the learning management system. And the quality of that work di dictates how the students interact in their lab sessions with the teacher. Really interesting uh, work here. Let's hear from a student and how they actually do this. With this, we've been doing like recording speech and sending it in for files so she can listen to us and then give us personal feedback, individual feedback. Um, and, and I think stuff like that has really been helpful too. It, it kind of, not only for the learning aspect of it, but it helps get the students engaged. So the real question is, will the flipped classroom approach work for you? We'll hear from colleagues in our session from a few disciplines about what's worked for them and what hasn't worked from them. And hopefully by then, by having viewed this and got some synapses happening on the concept, maybe done a bit of background reading, uh, you'll also be able to contribute to the session. I really look forward to seeing you. There's some pre-reading that uh, you may want to follow up on. There's a lovely video, for example, from the University of Texas on uh, this first link. There's also some uh, good work there from others, including JISC uh, in the UK. And I've given the last link, which is a link to one of my websites, which cites pretty much everything that I've mentioned during this talk. So good luck, enjoy the reading, and we'll see you at the session. Cheers. <laughs>